Welcome to the Healthy Perspective Podcast with your host, chiropractor, entrepreneur, mentor, and author, Dr. Chris Bowman. He'll break down and extract the secret sauce behind his own success and the success of some of the top leaders in every category and from around the world. Get ready for your weekly mental adjustment because shift is going to happen. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on another episode of the Healthy Perspective podcast. Today is another holistic health focused podcast, which I know all of you love to listen in on. We have Ms. Brandy Meilenberg. She is a registered respiratory therapist, certified integrative nutritional health coach. She's an author, a speaker, and host of the Functionally Autoimmune, uh, Autoimmune podcast and founder of Functionally Autoimmune. Brandy, thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, thank you, Chris, so much for having me on here. It's an honor. Of course. You know, I do um, workshops. I used to do more before the pandemic when it wasn't so taboo to meet in person. Uh, yeah. But uh, the, the most popular workshop was the Gut Brain Connection. Um, and there's a stat in there that I talk about. And I think it's like one in nine women are being diagnosed with an autoimmune disorder. And this isn't like one in nine women, you know, 60 years and older. This is like one in nine men, women in their childbearing age, like in their prime when they should be yeah. their healthiest and most adaptable. Um, I'm sure, you know, you're aware of stats and, and probably more, more stats than that. Um, why don't you kind of walk us through, you know, your journey that's probably so much like other people and we can just kind of dive into this autoimmune behemoth and see if we can help, um, you know, people ask better questions to get um, healthier and live healthier lives. Yeah, absolutely. So I kind of got thrown into the autoimmune world through my own health journey, like so many other people. I was young. I was in my late twenties. Um, you know, I had kids. I was, again, like you mentioned, I should have been in my prime and in the best health of my life. And really, I thought that I was, and I started having all of these symptoms, you know, unexpected weight gain, brain fog. Like I just couldn't concentrate. I was having joint pain. I was having all of these, like the list goes on and on. And I really was like, okay, something is wrong. I shouldn't be feeling like this. I exercise regularly. I eat well, like why, what's going on? And, you know, I went to my primary care doctor. She did lab work. What I thought was to be at that time, complete lab work. And she said, you're completely healthy. You're fine. Like it, nothing's wrong with you. And I was thinking I'm not okay. So anyway, like doctor after doctor, I ended up seeing over 45 physicians over the course of about eight years. I think and that takes the record. I mean, I see people as a last resort and usually it's only, you know, maybe five to 10, 45. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. It was primary care physicians. It was gastroenterologists. It was, I mean, I saw so many specialists wow. and every one of them pretty much had the same story. You're fine. Nothing's wrong with you. You're fine. Nothing's wrong with you. And, you know, at some point you want to think maybe I am crazy. Maybe there is nothing wrong with me, but I knew, I knew that there was something wrong and I wasn't willing to take that answer. And so that's one of the big things that's kind of led me to where I am is it's so easy when you're constantly knocked down and told that you're fine and you don't feel fine to just give up and be like, maybe I am fine. Maybe there is nothing wrong with me. Um, so it took me about 10 years to finally get to a doctor that was willing to do the lab work that I really needed done. And what's interesting about that is I actually had done my own research and I, you know, I failed to mention that I had worked in, in critical care in the healthcare world for more than 10 years. So I felt like I had a really good grasp of what was healthy and how the body worked and all these things. And so I started really researching. I talked to every doctor that I worked with. I really tried to gauge as much information as I could. And I self-diagnosed with celiac and Hashimoto's five to eight years. They were different times when I got the diagnoses, but five years for celiac, eight years for Hashimoto's. I diagnosed myself before I got an official physician to diagnose me. And so, it was, so I actually shifted my mindset. I started changing my diet around those specific conditions, what I could do to manage those. I started supplementation and I really started caring for myself. Obviously I couldn't write my own thyroid medication prescriptions. I couldn't do any of that, but I could do what I could do. And so 
through that journey, I met so many people whose stories sounded so much like mine. And so during that time, I thought I have to do something like this is ridiculous. I have to find some way to help people not have to go 10 years and see all these doctors to get answers. And so that's when I became certified as a health coach. Um, I'm actually working on my PhD in integrative nutrition. So that's what kind of launched me into this world of autoimmune disease. It wasn't something that I was planning on doing. It wasn't something that like was in the back of my mind at any point. I just kind of got thrown into it, I guess. <laughs> it was a calling. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I work in the, you know, the pediatric prenatal world of, of chiropractic. And we, for our, my first, we were planning to have a home birth and we ended up having to transfer to the hospital. We just, things couldn't get going. It wasn't an emergency. Nothing was really wrong, you know? Um, but after that experience, I was able to identify with my patients that had hospital births of, you know, kind of what goes on in there. And so an experience that was terrible for us that caused the first and I think only panic attack I've ever had in my life. Now I'm able to understand, you know, an OB had a con conversation with us when we wanted to leave AMA, when we refused certain things, you know, like I, I was yeah. under the, um, I don't know if I want to word it kindly or politically correct, but I, <laughs> I, I, I felt the abuse that, that the, the medical system, you know, employs on people that don't do exactly what they say or that question yeah. the things that they, um, you know, that they believe are, are right. And I, I, we don't, it's not like we're, we're personally attacking them. It's just yeah. like, look at me for me, not necessarily look at me according to, you know, my age and demographic and, you know, according to what the yeah. insurance says, you know? Yeah. Um, so I, I, even though I don't deal with autoimmune myself, like I identify with that, um, I don't know, that, that part of you that is, is knows something is wrong, knows mm -hmm. I'm, I'm right in the sense that you're, what you're telling me isn't, isn't explaining, isn't, isn't doing enough for me, you know, and I yeah. can't make change based on what you're telling me, you know, right. how do you, because I think this would help a lot of people. How did you continue to fight? How did you continue to, um, you know, keep that desire burning inside you to, to figure it out rather than just settling for a Xanax and steroids yeah. <laughs> like so many other do, you know, um, right. in that battle? You know, I've always been very ambitious, <laughs> I guess is a good way to put it. And I've always kind of, you know, if I'm given antibiotics or if I'm giving something, I'm like, okay, why do I need to take this? And, and I would usually be pretty compliant with it if I thought it was a valid reason. Right. Um, but I was always someone who didn't really like taking medications. I was somebody who never took pain medication. Like it wasn't something that I wanted to do. And so throughout this journey, I kept being offered all these medications. Well, you can take this, you can take that. We think you're just depressed, take this. And I was like, no, I, I really am not. That's not what's wrong with me. I'm not taking any of that. And so really it was just the strive to be the best that I could be for me. Um, I had so many ambitions in life that I wanted to do. And I knew that if I continued down this path of feeling terrible and barely being able to get out of bed that I wasn't going to be able to accomplish those. I wasn't going to be able to be the mother that I wanted to be the wife that I wanted to be. And so for me, that was my motivating factor was no, this isn't my answer. I I'm too young. I have too much life. I have too much ambition and I'm going to make sure that I can accomplish and do all of those things to the best of my ability. And so I just wasn't willing to just sit back and take it as an answer. And I had experiences with I can't even tell you some physicians said the most horrible things to me over the course of that time. And it would have been really easy for me to, to actually get very depressed and upset and to just believe it. And, and I didn't actually, it just, it fueled my fire, <laughs> honestly. And it made me want to fight even harder. And I'll give you an example. Um, I was having really bad stomach issues. And so my, my primary care physician said, we need you to go see this other gastroenterologist. We need to see if there's something going on that we're missing. And so literally the very first time I ever met this man, never been in his office. He knew nothing about me. We didn't know each other at all. And I went in there and I sat down and he came into the room and he said, so you're having stomach pain, what's going on? And so I just kind of explained, Hey, you know, I'm having these symptoms. I'm having unexplained weight gain. Like I'm having severe pain sometimes in my stomach. I don't know what it is. And he literally looked at me and this was our entire conversation. And he said, well, you know, if you stopped eating McDonald's and junk food, you probably would be fine. I was like, I, what? <laughs> he had no idea what my diet was. He had no idea what my lifestyle was. We had not had a conversation about it at all. And I literally stood up and walked out of that room. 
And that was the last time I ever saw him. And I think for some people, it's very hard to know that you can fire physicians, you can fire medical staff, you can fire any of those people who are not serving you. And it doesn't have to be a big ordeal. It doesn't have to be, it's literally getting up and walking out of the room. And so honestly, it was just, it was fueled by (laughs) anger and determination. (laughs) Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, how many kids did you have at the time? I have two. You had two kids. You know, I think so many moms, they, you know, I would probably say 65 to 75% of the people that I say day in and day out are in that exact phase, anywhere from, you know, maybe 28 to, to 40 ish, a kid or two, one on the way. You know, that, that's yeah. pretty much my, my practice. Um, I think that's a, a very formative time because you go from either having a college degree to kind of giving it up, you know, to, to have yeah. kids. Um, you're stressed because you have to be a one, you know, one family income, especially in Southern California, that's hardly doable anymore um you start to kind of lose this sense of of purpose you know my i i can't i don't feel good my kids are driving me crazy i don't have a career i have a bunch of school debt that i don't you know i'm I'm now putting on my husband to pay off what kind of i don't know what was that deep motivating purpose that now, what were these ambitions? What, how do you unlock that in people that you coach? Because I'm sure that's what you start with, you know, because there's no yeah. reason to get healthy if you have nothing to live for, mm-hmm. right? How do you unlock that with the people that you coach and that you help? Yeah, so usually by the time someone reaches out to me or wants to work with me, they have gotten to kind of the end of their ropes. They're still looking for answers. They, they're just, they're lost. And so that's where I start the conversation. Something brought you to me what was that? You know, what brought you to me? What, at what point are you and your journey and your hope for health that got you here? And so typically we'll talk through that. You know, a lot of times it's symptoms that they can't get rid of. It's just like I explained, they're just not, they don't feel like they're being listened to and they're not getting the answers that they need. And they just want someone to hear them out and understand them. And so, and, and a lot of times they want to live their lives. They want to be healthy. They, you know, I, I have clients that are like, they used to be competitive kayakers, um, competitive, you know, athletes in college, and they're active, healthy people that have these issues that are kind of being overlooked that they don't know how to deal with. And they want to get back to that. You know, if you are a competitive person, you are, you remain a competitive person and you want to be be doing those things, even if it's not at the collegiate level, or even if it's not at the level, maybe they were doing it before, they still want to do those things. And so typically we start there. What brought you here? What motivates you? What do you really want to accomplish in this? And that really is something that drives them. It's something that kind of, for a lot of them, it clicks the reason that they called because they're they're usually just desperate and they're like, I just need help. But if you kind of bring them back to what is it that you really want? What are you hoping to do? And sometimes it's as simple as I want to be able to go play in the park for hours with my kid. And I can't do that. Or I just want to be able to get out of the bed in the morning and go to work and feel like I have energy. I mean, it can be something so small all the way up to being a competitive kayaker. Like there's so many different things. And it's really just, that's where I start the conversation and it's unlocking that for them. Because when they have that, when they have their own personal why and they have that motivation, that is what's going to kickstart everything because everything else is hard. I mean, I don't ever tell anyone it's easy. It is, it is difficult to get through. Um, you know, if you have a gut health issue, it's difficult. It's a process to heal that and to get to the other side. If you're having these symptoms, they don't go away tomorrow. It takes a process and it takes time and it's difficult. It's not because you do want it to go away the very next day. You're like, Oh, I found you, please save me. Let's make it better today. But that's unfortunately not how it works. And so it does take some kind of motivation, some kind of drive to get you to the other side of it. And you absolutely can get to the other side of it. And I think people need to understand that too. That's, that's super helpful. You know, I think people can connect with that. You know, if they, they listen to this podcast and they hear that, you know, I think that'll be a super important thing. Um, what we talked a little bit about before, you know, we might be able to have a bit more of a high level conversation about, you know, what's going on physiologically, neurology, neurologically, immunologically, all the ologies, you know, and it makes me even more excited that you're going after your, your PhD and whatnot. Now, before I dive into the question, are you hoping to use PhD for research or more for like clinical or maybe a little bit of both? Yeah, really a little bit of both. I um, am very, very fascinated with 
the gut autoimmune connection and just yeah. gut health in general is just an amazing field that's growing. Um, so I definitely want to really do some research in that. But clinically, I want to expand my practice. I mean, ultimately, you want to reach as many people and help as many people as possible. And so that's really my biggest goal. So on the research side of things, then I'm sure so many people ask you, like, why? Why one in nine ladies today versus, you know, maybe when we were growing up, I never really heard of an autoimmune disease. Similarly, never really heard of autism either. Never really heard of um, uh, juvenile cancer. Never really heard of, you know, um, juvenile diabetes. I don't um, don't know, pediatric diabetes. I don't remember what that's called. But like, you know, all these things that are, I I know cancer is not really autoimmune, but you know, what? There, there's got to be some sort of bigger question, bigger thing that they're missing. You know, yeah. autoimmune, I think, is a very small, well, it's a large um, word for a lot of tiny things that are going on. You know, one of the slides that I have in my, in my workshop is like an autoimmune can be autoimmune of anything. The bone, the skin, you know, the, any organ in the body can have some sort of self, you know, attacking mechanism, yeah. each with its different diagnosis and different, you know, treatment measures and, and whatnot. But I think, you know, if, we were able to pull back the curtain and it's like, what is autoimmune? Where is it coming from? Um, I'm sure we could talk about this for hours. So maybe, yes. um, may, maybe what, what are the things that you've seen that have changed from, you know, 15, 20, 30 years ago when these things weren't yeah. really heard of um, mm-hmm. to now? And then uh, maybe after that, we can go into, so based on that, what are some things that we can be doing now to either be preventative or maybe the first step or two um, that are able to get people healthy? Because I know, um, it's different for everybody. A probiotic for one person might be terrible for another person. Yeah. Kale for one person would be great, might be terrible for another person. You know what yeah. I mean? So I know I, yeah. I don't want you to give blanket advice, um, but yeah. I think you get where I'm going. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, honestly, it's very interesting. And I've done a r- lot of research on this. And I think that the research on this area will continue because there's actually a very direct correlation between the increase of autoimmune condition, cancer, diabetes, all of the things you just listed and the way that our food supply changed. So around 1960 is really when our food supply started adjusting drastically. So we have now high fructose corn syrup and everything. We have abundance of processed food. We have um, ways that we are producing and creating food that's very different than it was prior to 1960. And what's even more interesting, and I've done talks on this dozens and dozens of times, so I could talk about it forever, but what's even more interesting is that our grains, specifically wheat, corn, and rice, has been completely modified from its original chemical structure in 1960. Um, And and there was actually um, a gentleman who won a Nobel Peace Prize for creating this new new strand of wheat. Mm -hmm. And it is chemically completely different from what we had prior to 1960. And if you look at the data prior to that date, and then the data from 1960 to current dates, it's almost a 400% increase climbing consecutively as the years go from that change. And so a really big part of what's causing all of this is our diet. Is that completely all of it? No, there's so much other things that go into activating those genes, but really a huge part of it is what we've done to our food supply. And so if I was going to tell anyone any advice, it would be to reduce your processed food, try and completely remove high fructose corn syrup. It it does not serve you. It has no nutritional value and really try to reduce your gluten and grains as much as possible. And honestly, I usually start my clients with go 30 days without grains, just try for 30 days see what your symptoms do. Because a lot of times that's going to tell you if your symptoms don't change at all, then that's not serving you. We'll look at something else. If you find a drastic uh, decrease in your symptoms, then we've found something. And that's probably not the total answer, but a lot of times that will reduce so many symptoms that we can actually then pinpoint actual root causes and what's going on. And so if I had to give one piece of advice, it would absolutely be look at your diet. The majority of Americans eat um, a mass quantity of processed food. That's what's available. That's what's easy. That's what's um, affordable to buy. It's, it's the, it's usually what we're feeding our kids. It's what the schools are feeding our kids. Um, But it, it doesn't have the nutritional value that our body needs. And literally everything you put into your mouth 
is the second it touches your mouth, a chemical reaction occurs. The whole entire process through digestion is a chemical reaction. And so if your body doesn't know what that is, if it's not something that's actually food, <laughs> it's something that we've created or processed, your body doesn't know what to do with it. And the chemical reaction doesn't occur properly. So that's really the biggest, the, the number one thing that I start with and the number one thing I would have people look at. It's good, you know, and it's, it's pretty simple. Like it's, it's not like this, you know, go buy this $900 supplement that you can only get on this yeah. website and only get via IV or, you know what I mean? Like yeah. a lot of people spend a lot of money chasing symptoms mm -hmm. while fueling the cause. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and, and it really doesn't, doesn't work. I'm interested to see if you're, and this is kind of a selfish question, if you've come across in your research, what happens when people that are sensitive to gluten and to dairy, specifically like the casing, like what happens with those um, gluten molecules and, and casing molecules inside the body when they're not digested? Yeah. So that's something that's still being very heavily researched because, you know, like I mentioned, we still, we know a lot more about the gut microbiome than we have ever before, but there's still so much that we don't know. And so a lot of times when you eat something nutritious, let's say you eat an apple, the body knows what that is. It knows how to break apart the carbs, the sugars, all of that. And it knows how to put every one of those molecules where it needs to go in the cells. When you eat something that's processed, that's actually doesn't have that nutritional value, it pulls apart the parts that it can and gets those to the cells, but then the other parts, it doesn't really know what to do with it. So it still kind of pushes it out into the cells and it's kind of hoping that it lands somewhere that it's supposed to go, but it doesn't really have a home. So typically what happens is your cells, your immune cells see that and they think, oh, is this, is this a good thing that's happening here where it's like a friend and we don't attack it? Is this something that we attack? And so what happens with autoimmune condition is it's our immune cells start confusing all of this. And so then it chooses whether it's your thyroid, your bones, your whatever, and it starts attacking it because it's gotten very confused. And so we're still really trying to learn why that's happening chemically. Why is that happening in the gut? And we know now that leaky gut is something that is very prevalent. It's something that happens kind of through that process over time. And so even if your body gets those molecules and it's thinking, oh, this isn't anything we can use, and it typically wouldn't absorb those and send them out to the cells because your gut's so leaky and has kind of these cheesy holes in them, if you think of like Swiss cheese, mm -hmm. um, it can get out into the cells, even if your system doesn't want them there. So that's kind of where a lot of that happens. And really processed foods, high fructose corn syrup, those things really, really cause those issues. When we're talking about gluten specifically, Prior to 1960, our wheat, wheat in general, was 36 chromosomes. Modern day wheat that was invented after 1960 is 96 chromosomes. So if you think about genetically how those cells work in the body and your body's used to, oh, this 36 chromosome molecule, I know what this is, I know what to do with it, it's a carbohydrate, this is what I do. All of a sudden it's 96 chromosomes and it's like, wait a, wait a minute, <laughs> it looks familiar. It's not familiar. What do we do with this thing? And that's where a lot of the symptoms come from because our body doesn't recognize it or know what to do with it. And so it ends up causing all of these issues. Something that I've heard is that the, the casein and gluten specifically can um, bind to receptors that are also binding to uh, like morphine like substances, mm -hmm. which is why people can have the brain fog also why it becomes addictive right and so why yeah. people when they go off of those things can have like literal withdrawal symptoms they get Absolutely. you know they, they call it hangry or you know they get they get chills they get fevers they get i mean it is so scary to me that you can go buy a loaf of bread from the shelf for mm -hmm. you know 15 years or whatever and not buying that loaf of bread is going to cause the same symptoms as if you're coming off of you know cocaine morphine or you know those sort of things like that should be an eye opener to some people of how far our system has gone from an actual food you know system to a chemical right system, you know um yeah. something else that i've come across is um like you mentioned the different type of you know way or not way um um, wheat, you know, that's being grown mm -hmm. is in our rushed industrialized, you know, farming, uh, I don't know, ecosystem, I suppose, if you can yeah. call it that, maybe the <laughs> system, huh? Um, this wheat grows very fast. Mm -hmm. And then they chemically dry it. Yeah. And they harvest it. So that way they can get two harvests in the same year instead right. of only one. 
are you familiar with like what happens when you dry like super green wheat or like the, the gluten composition? Yeah. Yeah. So if you, so I guess it's, if you think of wheat as a grass, cause that's what it is. So think about your lawn, right. Or if you have livestock, if you have horses or cows, there are, and I'm a horse person, I have horses. So this analogy works for me, but hay is a grass as well. Just like wheat is just like your lawn, just like, you know, um, corn and those things are grasses. So if you think about the hay that we feed to livestock, right? So a farmer can typically get two to three bale or servings of grains for horses out of one field, right? So basically it grows in the spring. The spring grass is very full of sugar. It's very high carbohydrate. Like it's a lot of farmers will try and keep their cattle and horses actually offspring grass because of the sugar content, because it's so high. Mm. So what they do is then they wait a little bit, they cut it, they let it dry out because the drying process actually removes a little bit of the sugar, but actually not very much. And as the season goes on, each cutting is a completely different composition. So the sugar content, the carbohydrate content, the vitamin content, all of those things completely change over time. So if you're cutting, same exact thing would happen with wheat, right? Because grasses are basically grown the same way. We just happen to only eat the seeds of wheat. We don't eat the stalks or the grass part of it because we can't physically digest it. So the same kind of thing happens. So if they're growing wheat and they really early, they have some kind of young wheat growing, but they want to get another crop or two out of it and they cut that, that first cutting is going to be very high in, in sugar. It's going to be, you know, it's going to have very different properties than the second and the third cuttings. And so even if it comes from the same exact farm, from the same exact processing source, if they're telling you this is the same exact, you know, hybrid wheat, whatever it is, it's actually very different because it depends on when they cut it, how they process it and what they do with it. Not to mention that it's already a problem just because of how, how wheat is grown these days. Mm -hmm. And so it absolutely makes a difference. And what typically happens is this wheat is harvested, it's dried out and it's placed in like a grain bin to continue its drying process and all of that. The next cutting will typically also be added to that. And so then it's mixed. So you're not actually getting for the most part, you're not getting one cutting specifically and then a separate one. You're getting a mixture of all of them. So there's really no way to know when you're going to buy a loaf of bread, what exactly is in there. It's it's impossible to know. And that's super interesting. And that starts to connect the dots of, like I've had patients go to Europe and buy bread, get all the noodles, all the, you know, yeah. gelato and, you know, all those sort of things. And like, my tummy actually felt really good. Like I didn't have any issues at all, mostly because it's probably coming from a single farm, single family, doing one cut, processing that while the next one is being done. And yeah. so you're, you're having, you know, you know what you're getting. It's being harvested at the proper time versus the industrialized system of, of just mass right. production, right? Um, yeah. Something else, and we don't have to go too deep into it if it's something that you don't want to go into it, but there's something also, you talk about a difference in our food from mm -hmm. 19, the 1960s. Um, there's also, if you look at statistics, um, after 1989, if you were born before 1989, it's like a very low chance of developing some sort of child chronic hood, or childhood mm -hmm. chronic disease. After 1989, it rises you know, dramatically. Um, what are some of the things that have changed at that point? So we can think about our lifestyle when it comes to that. So if we go outside of food, which is kind of the number one thing I look at, then it's lifestyle. So around the 1980s is when we really started spending a lot of time watching TV. We started seeing, um, I mean, cell phones weren't invented quite yet in the 1980s, but we started seeing a lot of technology. Computers started coming up. We started having these things. And so what happened was over time we spent a lot more time in front of these devices. We spent a lot more time kind of not being as active, um, sitting around a lot, which obviously is, is causing us some issues. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is with the screen time, we actually started seeing a complete decrease in sleep. So people started having mass insomnia. They started having sleep disorders that con continued. If you think about sleep apnea, that has increased by about 150% since about 1990. So you probably know or have met someone that has sleep apnea. Almost everybody knows somebody or is themselves. And that wasn't a thing prior to 1980. I mean, sure, there were a couple people here and there who had it 
but it wasn't a mass problem like it is now. And so sleep disorders became a huge problem. And the issue with that is sleep is where our body rebuilds, rejuvenates, repairs cells. I mean, so much beneficial things happen while we're sleeping that if we're missing out on that time, then our body doesn't have the time it needs to do all of those things. And so a big part of that and a big focus that I have my clients look at is what's your sleep quality? Because everybody needs a different amount of sleep. Everybody's different. But for a grown adult, you should be somewhere between six to 10 hours of sleep. And again, it depends on you. It depends on what you need. But you should be able to go to bed, wake up in the morning, feeling refreshed, rejuvenated, and ready for the day. And if you're not, then there's something going on with your sleep. And if you're having sleep issues, your body is having issues rebuilding, rejuvenating, and restoring. And so that is something that has drastically changed since 1980. And I think along with that is also stress levels. I think that we didn't used to be as stressed as we are now. And if you talk to, say you gather a group of a hundred people, about 90% of those people are going to tell you, yeah, they feel stressed out most of the time. They're overworked. They have, you know, home duties. They have all these things. And that wasn't a problem back then. So I think a combination of those things has really, really played a role in increasing our, our chronic illness. Yeah, I would agree with you 100%. And it's not like stress is just this, on this gradual, you know, you know, it seems like with every passing moment, it's like another, you know, sharp uptick. Um, yeah. Something that is in my world, and I'll let you comment however you want to comment, or if you don't want to comment at all, it's fine. Something that I see in my world is I'll get, um, you know, kids coming in that mm-hmm. seemed relatively healthy, um, you know, went to their well check visit, got a round of, you know, four or five different vaccines, and they'll notice something's, you know, a little bit different. And the sad thing, whether you want to you know, believe them, whether you do them or, or not, the sad thing is, is side effects are relatively ignored you know, by the medical system. And it doesn't make sense when you're investigating a gut issue or you're investigating an immune issue. Vaccines mm-hmm. are something that is directly designed to stimulate the immune system. And we're looking at all these different genetic mutations now, the MTHFR, um, you know, all of those ones that really were unheard of back then. Yeah. And why they're becoming an issue now. It's like, oh, we used to do the, you know, now I talk to a lot of, you know, parents, oh, I got all mine and I'm fine. And, you know, and so they're looking at doing the same thing for their kids. And like, well, look at the environment that you grew up in. You didn't have gmo wheat. You didn't have gmo yeah. high fructose corn. You didn't have, you know, stuff flying around in the air. You didn't have the stuff in your water. And so people that are suffering with genetic mutations that reduce the body's ability to detox, yeah. injecting something might be a little bit more than that body can handle. And the body is going to react in such a way where it's going to look inflamed. And inflamed looks like many different symptoms from a neurodevelopmental disorder to an autoimmune to skin Mm -hmm. rashes. You know, all those sort of things are are reactions to it. Um, Do you have any comments for parents that are, that might just might be wondering, you know, um, I noticed something's different, even with me, even after, you know, a, a, um, you know, a recommended pharmaceutical, not even necessarily vaccines, maybe even just the antibiotic, but yeah. they go to their doctor with, could this be related? And they, re- they, they say, no, you know, like, yeah. is there, I find them not typically readily to admit that something that they recommended didn't work. Um, yeah. Where could they go um, to ask these questions in a safe way? Or what type of questions can they ask if they are interested, if these, you know, sort of, um, you know, medical interventions might be related to the things that they're experiencing? Right. Yeah. And I think honestly, there's a high probability that if you're having new symptoms, it's probably from a treatment that you're doing. I mean, it's, it's just the reality. Um, I will tell you a quick story uh, related to vaccines because my son who is, he's now 14 years old, but when he was um, about 11 or 12, they, the pediatrician said, Hey, he needs to take this HPV vaccine. And we thought, okay, cool, whatever it, he's getting, he's getting his flu shot. Go ahead and give it to him. Um, Literally the following day from the HPV vaccine, he had sores all inside of his mouth, all over his face, and he, could, he couldn't eat for about three weeks. I mean, he literally was on a liquid diet for three weeks. They were that bad and they were super painful. So when this happened, we of course took him back to the pediatrician and we, I, I knew immediately, I said, listen, the HPV vaccine did this and I need, he needs something like he's in pain and this, what can we do? And the first thing they said to me was, no, that didn't come from the HPV vaccine. Okay, well, (laughs) let's not argue. (laughs) Let's just see what we can do for my kid. So it was, that was the very initial response, knowing full well that my son had never had issues like this. It's not anything he had ever experienced. He got that vaccine the very following day that happened. Mm. So ever since then, 
when he goes to the pediatrician, they realize that he has had one HPV vaccine and they keep offering him the second one. Well, now that he is 14, he himself is like, absolutely not. I'm not taking that thing because he remembers the nightmare that he went through having done all of that. And so of course we decline it every time. And they, you know, to this day, I'll occasionally have a nurse or a doctor say, you know, that's not what probably caused that. And I'm like, yeah, well it is, but it's okay. It's, it's whatever. <laughs> So it's, it is, it is kind of a normal response is no, that's not what caused that. No, that, that just, you just happen to have come into contact with a bacteria or something like that. And typically that's not the case. Usually it is your body has reacted to something that you you've taken or been given or whatever. And the reality is everybody's body is not going to respond to things the same way. I mean, you could take an antibiotic and I could take the exact same one for the exact same condition. And I could have a complete like skin rash breakout and you could have nothing. And it doesn't mean that, oh, well, you just happen to have a skin rash breakout. It means that my body can't tolerate that. Mm -hmm. And so the important thing I think for people is listen to your body, listen to your kids when they talk about how they feel, because they know their bodies better than anybody else. Just like, you know, your body better than anybody else. If you go to your doctor, your pediatrician, and you say, Hey, I'm concerned that this medication, this vaccine, this whatever caused this, and they dismiss you, it's time to find a new physician. I mean, that's the reality. Um, I have found, you know, functional medicine doctors, chiropractic doctors like yourself. I have found those specialties to be a lot more accepting, a lot more willing to listen to you than conventional doctors, which is a shame, <laughs> but it's, but it's, it's been kind of the reality of what I've seen. And not to make it their fault, because I don't think that, you know, anybody's out there to do harm or to, to be bad. I think it's just, that's what they were taught and that's what they know. And so it's, like I said before, it's okay to find a new doctor. I mean, it, it really is find one that's willing to listen to you find one that's like, oh yeah, that is actually interesting that that happened after he got that vaccine. What do you think we can do about that? And maybe he shouldn't get the next vaccine. Like that's really what you want to hear. <laughs> yeah. I couldn't agree with you more. You know, I think the, maybe the overarching theme of this whole conversation is industry, whether it be medical, pharmaceutical, um, maybe even political, <clears throat> agricultural, has changed from this individualistic, what's best, what does the wheat need to grow to grow the best quality wheat out there to mm -hmm. more of a chemical mindset? How do yeah. we grow it the fastest? What's the least amount of input that we can put in there? And I yeah. think medical system is the same. What's going to get this person outside my door as quickly as possible? Mm -hmm. What's the quickest fix? So that way, um, what's the cheapest fix? What's, what am I going to get reimbursed for? It's moved from this looking at the organism and, mm -hmm. and the ecosystem and how everything works together to piecing things out and thinking that it forms the same exact mosaic. You know, and yeah. ultimately, I, I, don't, I don't think that's true. And, and I think you know, maybe the theme of, of what you, you know, teach and, and, and are investing a lot of time and money into researching um, and learning and, and same as myself and people out there. I, I think that's the perspective that is different. You know, whether you believe yeah. in holistic health, whether you believe this and that and the other thing, it's taking a step back and looking at what does the organism need to express optimal health? It needs yeah. plants and animals that have also been given the opportunity to get, get, you know, optimal resources to express optimal health. If you're eating things that aren't expressing optimal health and that are a chemical composition, you in turn will become that chemical composition with a whole bunch of wasted and foreign things in which that organism will start to become healthy. So eat things that raise your energy vibrational level rather than things that are trying to piece it out because it's not the same. We, I don't think man can replicate life no matter how hard we try. <laughs> it will never be the same as what was created in the beginning. Um, yeah. Randy, thank you so much for joining me. This was a really fun conversation, and I think um, a lot of people are going to enjoy it. Um, if people want to find out more about you, um, maybe have a conversation with you, um, you know, read your, your books or your blogs, where can people go? The easiest place to go is functionally autoimmune.com. Um, all of my services, all of my, I have a blog post there. All of my books that I've written are listed there. Um, it's the easiest way to find anything about me there. Um, my podcast is also linked on there as well. And the podcast is called functionally autoimmune. But if you go to my website, that's the easiest way to find me. You can also find me on Instagram at Brandy Meilenberg. Um, and I put some good information on there too, and just kind of have fun with it. But um, yeah, that's the best way to find me. 
Awesome. Thank you so much for joining me. I can't wait for everyone to listen. Yeah, thank you so much. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you for listening to the Healthy Perspective Podcast. To connect with Dr. Bowman, follow him on Instagram at Dr. Chris Bowman. Until next time, make shift happen.